No, no, no. no, no. no. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? That's true. Is somebody going to tell us whether they are going to take and hear us? Someone to put their hand up if they can hear. Diana, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. 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 Okay, okay. So because we are still, you know, uh, trying to fix things here. But anyway, I think that now we can start the the next lecture with Advocate Norma Alvarez. Um, I um, also don't need to introduce her because she's been in the High Court um, on uh, red petitions now for the last uh, 30 years. And uh, um, she knows all the ins and outs of uh, red petitions and uh, how to file them. And uh, so she has drawn up a five slide uh, lecture, which she will give today. And um, just to tell you that she has argued about 250 PILs in the High Court of Bombay. 250, I don't know any other record of any other lawyer who has done this much. And she has argued uh, on all aspects of environment law from, from the CRZ to forest law, to pollution control, uh, to illegal constructions, outline development plans, planning, uh, town and country planning law, forest law, whatever it is. So um, uh, we look forward to um, her uh, talk this evening. And um, after that, the next session, I just want to link it before I get out, it will be we will take up specific problems and work on a red petition through with the help of Anamika Gode, who is the other council. I know uh, with the uh, Goa Foundation, but that will come on, on, on Monday because we have to adopt a completely innovative approach considering that you know, we have to change the format to suit uh, Zoom during this uh, COVID times. So without much ado, I will um, uh, invite uh, Norma to start uh, her lecture and uh, please enjoy yourself. Yeah. Okay, good evening everyone. Um, so far, you have been getting theory given to you by various lawyers from constitutional law to um, various aspects of different laws, environment laws, structure of courts, administration of justice, structure of government, and so on. And today, it's my task to make you a lawyer overnight. I don't know how, how well I will succeed, but I have to, I've been assigned the task of teaching you or showing you how to prepare a petition for the courts and also how to argue it. Uh, I hope to take around 45 minutes to max one hour to give you the broad um, skills that you would need in order to um, prepare the petition and then how you present it before the court. Now, this will be useful whether you intend to argue the petition yourself or whether you intend to get a lawyer. Uh, it is useful to know what a lawyer would want if you are going to take a matter, environment matter, or a human rights matter before the court. First and foremost, what is a writ petition and what is a PIL? They are both actually the same. A writ petition, you go to a court to ask for a writ. A writ is a direction. It is an order. You may have heard of the expression, the writ of the king or the writ of the government. It's a British word. It means the what is the order which will be passed by the authority. So you go to the court to ask for a writ. There are five writs. The most important one that is used in public interest litigation is a writ of mandamus, which means do something or it means stop doing something, one of the two. There are other writs, there's a habeas corpus, which is filed by people when 
someone is uh, imprisoned and you suspect that, uh, well, maybe he's killed, maybe they are hiding him, maybe they're not producing him before a magistrate, then you ask for a um, habeas corpus writ, which is produce the body. I don't want to go into all the writs, but basically you are going to the court asking for a writ. Now, a writ petition is, you f is filed when there is something which you are interested in, when you are what is called the affected party, which means you have what is also called locus standi. You have got position. You are a person who has been affected by some violation of law, and so you are coming to the court to ask the court to remove that problem to uh, or put something or do something. So writ petition is filed when you want something personally for yourself. A public interest litigation, which is what I am interested in explaining to you, is filed when you are not the only affected party, which means that you are asking for some direction in the interests of public, in the interests of the general public, in the interests of a group of citizens, group of people. That's the difference between a public interest litigation and a writ petition. Both are heard simultaneously in the court at the same time. If you went to a court register, you would hear uh, writ petition number so-and-so followed by PIL number so-and-so. These are all coming on the list, the index in the court. So there's no very big difference, but there are times when you can go for a PIL and there are certain times when you can go for a writ petition. So you go to the court in a writ petition or in a PIL when there is a violation of law and when you want a civil remedy, it's a civil violation. Difference being that you must have heard this before, criminal is punitive, civil is redressal, which means that if you are, if it's a criminal matter, then you cannot compromise, you cannot settle it. But if it's a civil matter, it is possible for you to settle the matter, which the courts also permit by compensation, by giving money, by settling the matter out of court, in the court, and so on. The public interest litigation, as I told you, comes in when you are not affected, but you are pleading the cause of the general public. You see some violation of law, you say it affects the general public, and so you come forward to plead that cause. So what is the subject? Let me tell you what I will do in this first section. Uh, I'll share you the screen. Um, okay. Is this coming on? Um, are you, uh, just uh, get me this first thing on the screen. Just, just a moment. Huh? They, they told me what to do. Just a moment. I, how do I get double it? Ah, double click. Okay. And then I go to, where's that next thing? Okay. All right. So, so in my first little section, I will deal with what, what could be the subject of a PIL or a writ petition. And now I'm not going to do writ petition anymore. I'm just going to do PIL. And I will deal with these aspects, the site visit, the RTI Act, applicable law, demand for justice, and what I have called appeal against permissions. Now, I, I, don't, I don't think you need to worry about taking all this down because I have prepared a lecture note also, and I will share this lecture note with you via, um, via email. Okay, now, how do I get back? Stop sharing. Okay, so, um, what what can be the subject of a PIL? Anything. It could be an environment issue. It could be a human rights issue. It can be something which affects women and children. It could be it could be any violation of law. If you are taking it up on behalf of the public, it becomes it could become a public interest litigation, or you at least will be filing the public interest litigation. 
uh, a, a PIL can be filed only in the high court. You cannot file a PIL in any of the lower courts. Whereas in the case of a writ petition, you normally go to a lower court first and then you come in appeal in the high court. So anything which is, let us say, some activity in your neighborhood, which you see, or something that you see on your way to work, anything that you see, it is a violation of law, which you see a building coming up in the coastal area and you think it's a violation of law. Uh, trees being cut down, which you think is a violation of law. Um, an industry which is uh, um, uh, depositing its effluence in the river and you think that it's a violation of law. You are coming to the court, you want to file a public interest litigation, you want the court to stop this activity. What are the things that you need to do in order to prepare for a PIL? First thing is make a site visit. You have to make a site visit because you have to know this personally. You have to know that this is happening in this area so that, so that you can testify or attest that what you are telling the court is true to your own knowledge. Very, very important. I will come to it a little later. You have to file an affidavit saying, these paragraphs in my petition are true to my own knowledge and these paragraphs are my submissions in law. That is what I believe to be true. So you cannot go to a, file a PIL on the basis of a newspaper report. You read something in the newspaper, you say, oh, this is a violation. I, I must take, file a public interest litigation. You attach that newspaper and you think that the court will take action. Oh no, the court will not take action because you are coming to the court on the basis of hearsay. The newspaper is saying it, so you are coming. Or someone tells you that something is happening and you file a petition. That also won't do. You have to file a petition. When you file a petition, you must make a site visit and see for yourself. Now, what if you can't see for yourself? Then you'll have to say that this is told to me by so-and-so who has seen it, which is a sort of a roundabout way. And then the court will ask you, well, why can't that person then file the petition instead of you? Because we want somebody who will truthfully tell us what is happening and not somebody who will relate a story to us. A reason for a site visit is also so that you can take photographs. Any construction, you need to take a photograph of what is at the site. Any destruction of trees, you have to take a photograph of what's at the site. So you can take a picture of what is at the site. When you take a photograph, how, do you, how does the court know that it is taken on so-and-so date and not taken two years earlier? Well, the common practice for people is to put a newspaper. But please see, when you take, put a newspaper with the date on it, which has got some picture on the, on the front page and has a date, see that the paper is not covering the whole site. Sometimes people bring you a picture of the site, the newspaper is covering three quarters and in one corner you see some half a tree and something like that. So just position your newspaper in a correct manner. But nowadays the all cameras are there with digital dates and so on. So I think better use a digital camera. Uh, when you go to the site, check the site. If it's a construction site, then check whether there is the list of approvals. Look around for it because as per law, all sites have to give the name of the party whose construction, the dates of the permissions and so on. If there is nothing on the site and there is some work going on, chances are likely that there is no permission for it. If the permissions are there, take a snapshot of it, copy it down, because those are the permissions that you will use in order to um, file your writ petition. So now you've gone to the site, you have seen for yourself, you think that there is a violation of law and you want to take action. You have done the first step. Then you now need to get the permissions, you got a list of permissions that were produced at the site which you have seen. You need to find out now what permissions have been given and when they have been given. For this purpose, what will you use? 
the RTI Act. It's a wonderful act, which is cheap to start with and can be used effectively. When you use the RTI Act, please file an application first for inspection of the file. Don't ask straight away, I want copies pertaining to this particular project. Sometimes there are a huge number of copies and you know the, the government wants to dissuade you. So they will send you a, a bill of three and a half thousand or five thousand or even more than that because you've asked for copies pertaining and you'll get a whole lot of rubbish. So what you should do is ask for inspection of the file. When you inspect the file, you look for the copies that are relevant. Don't look, you know, see there are certain permissions which are relevant. Some things are copies of copies. Some things will be some lot of documents. Some things will be reports, project change. Lots of things will be there. Go through it carefully. Sometimes the authority doesn't mind if you take a snapshot. You use your phone and take pictures. But sometimes they object. In which case, copy down the date of the document of that particular project, what you want and then file a second RTI afterwards for copies of those documents. So instead of getting, for example, 600 documents, you may be actually wanting only 15, which you can then ask for. So use the RTI to get the, ins the permissions that have been granted for that, um, for that particular project. Then go to applicable law find out what is the law which is relevant to that project. If it's a construction project, they will definitely need a town planning permission. They will need a panchayat permission. Uh, there will be, if they have felled trees, there will be a trees permission that they will need. If it's an industry, there will be permission from the pollution control board. If it's in this coastal area, they will need a CRZ clearance and so on find out applicable law. Now here I suggest that you take the assistance of a lawyer because lawyers generally have a fair idea of the range of permissions which is required so that you only don't go with one or two permissions. Maybe there are many more that you could bring to the table. At the same time, when you are checking the applicable law, you have to also check whether the uh, 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 um, a petition or uh, 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 an appeal lies before an authority. That also a lawyer could help you because what you need to see is whether you are jumping the gun and going to the high court too soon because the high court will send you back. So you have to find out that if there is a permission given can this permission be appealed? And in how much time can it be appealed? So if it's a permission to some industry, then if you, are, if you are challenging that, if you think that that permission is wrong, then you have to go before the appellate authority and you have to file an appeal. And if the appellate authority does not agree with you, then you go to the NGT under the Air Act and the Water Act and so on. So rushing to the High Court will not help you at all because you'll just waste your time and waste your money. The other side will say, this is a matter which can be appealed before the appellate tribunal and your case will be over. So ask a lawyer to help you on two counts. One is, what is the applicable law? And second, is that matter appealable? If it is appealable, there will be a limited period within which you can appeal. There will be usually 30 days. Now, in your case, for example, it may be beyond 30 days. So it all is not lost. You have to only file an application for condonation of delay, which usually is granted. You have to say that this is a matter which is a serious environment issue and we have come to know only on so and so date because we saw the trees being felled or because we saw the boat put up or you can say there was no boat put up and then under RTI I found out and as soon as I have got the relevant information I have come and therefore please condone the delay. 
which normally is condoned. Very rarely is it not condoned, unless it can be the other side or shows that you applied for the permissions in, uh, let us say, uh, January 2019, and you didn't bother to go and collect the documents till uh, April 2020. Then the court will say, look, you wasted your own time, sorry. We can't do anything. In that case also, you can go to the high court after that, but you first have to go to the appellate authority to appeal the order on whatever grounds you, uh, you, you take. After you've done that, write your demand for justice letter. On the last session, you have heard about demand for justice. You have to write to the relevant authority pointing out the violation of law and demanding justice. That means demanding redressal. And you have to wait a little bit for the authority to act because the purpose of a demand for justice letter is basically to inform the authority so that the authority can act and you don't have to take the trouble to come to the court. I don't think it happens, but this is the law and I think it's a good enough thing because in a certain sense, it alerts the authorities to the fact that you are going to file a petition. So they start getting ready to take to figure out what they are going to say in case you go to the court. When you write your demand for justice letter, please write a separate letter to every authority who is relevant. Most often I've seen people tend to write to the governor. Now the governor, as you know, is a constitutional authority who does very little in actual fact because he is bound by the opinions by and large of the cabinet and the council of ministers. So he's a figurehead. He's very nice. He will talk nicely to you, but he can't do anything. Very, very little. I'm not saying don't write to the governor. I'm saying, I'm saying that write to the relevant authority. Whoever is the person in charge of that department write a letter to him or her. Very often you will see, I've seen, people write a letter to the chief minister and they make copies to all 10, 11, 12 departments. Now remember, when a letter is written to the chief minister and the town planning department gets a copy and the pollution control board gets a copy and the CRZ gets a copy and sometimes Goa Foundation also will get one copy, who will act? All the others will say he's addressed the letter to the chief minister and he's just FYI for your information sent it to us. They will not act at all. Chief minister also won't act. Governor also will not have acted. So nothing will happen. Of course, you can use that demand for justice letter if you're filing a PIL, but you have actually not made a demand for justice to the right authority. So I tell people, don't waste the paper sending it to all the people. Write a letter independently to each authority. Instead of sending a copy where you still have to put the stamp if you're posting it or the whatever way, address it to the chief minister. Next one, address it to the uh, chairman pollution or the member secretary pollution control board. Next one, address it to the officer in charge um, forest department. If you don't know who to address it to, put officer in charge. That also will do. That means it has to go. It's the it's uh, job of the, uh, the authority office to send it to the correct place. So write an independent letter to each authority and try to even change you know, a, a line or two. The opening lines can be changed. You, know, you are in charge of this department and this is what has happened or whatever. Whatever it is, write independent letters to each authority. Wait a little bit so that they can take action. I will come to what happens if you can't wait a little bit, you can go to the court, but generally you have to give a little bit of time to the authority to take action. But a demand for justice is a must. If you do not demand for justice, the court will not take up your matter because it means you have come to the court without intimating and exercising the requirement of conveying this wrong to the requisite authority so that they can act 
on it. That is the first section. Just a minute. Now share with you. One second. Okay. Mouthful. Oh, sorry. One minute. A little bit new to all this. Okay. With this, we come to the second part. Now you've done your preparatory work and now you are going to prepare your PIL. So I'm going to deal with how you will prepare the PIL and what you see on the screen is that the subjects that I will talk about. Okay. So you have decided now you have done your demand for justice. You have got photographs of the site. You have collected the permissions which you, which you know of, which you find. You have used the RTI for that. You've got your sort of stuff together and you want to now prepare a PIL. When I say prepare a PIL, it could mean that you want to file the PIL yourself or you want to take it to a lawyer. Even if you want to take it to the lawyer, I suggest you prepare the PIL. Because if you prepare the PIL, it, it, uh, the PIL is filed that much faster rather than taking all your papers helter-skelter and going to the lawyer's office and trying to explain to him. So if you can prepare the PIL, it's much better. In fact, whenever people come to me, I tell them, by the time I get to your petition, please write down all that you want to say and send it to me in whatever kind of English you want, but just put it down because your thoughts are very important. How will you prepare a PIL? First of all, think in your mind and prepare the basic issues which you are challenging. What is it that you want to challenge? You may want to challenge a lot of things, but try to focus what your petition is about. Is it about a construction coming in the CRZ area? Then that is your opening prelim paragraph because in a PIL, you have to have a first paragraph, which is very, very important and you must draft it very well. That first paragraph gives a very short summary of the main point in the petition. See, courts don't have time to read everything. So when the matter comes before them, they read your first paragraph to see what is the issue. You also have to give a paragraph to the, to the court on what are the points that you are raising in the petition? What are the issues you are raising? You are raising, going to raise an issue of whether a, a construction which is in the CRZ can come up without the permission of the GCZ. Whether a construction in the CRZ can come up by destruction of sand dunes. Whether a construction can come up in the industrial area without the pollution control board's consent to operate. Where to, to establish whether the, con the factory can start work without consent to operate. These are the kind of issues, but you must think of what is the focus of your petition and what are the main points that you want to agitate. Sometimes I've had people who have come to me who have said, I remember there was one case where a guy wanted to fight the, some hotel, which was in, uh, in uh, Bogmalo, and he had a whole lot of environment issues and he also had several financial issues, some kind of uh, scam and some monies and all that. And he wanted to put both. I told him, you cannot put both. You can't put finance and environment and everything together. Maybe there are several problems, but you must decide what you want to take up because courts do not like several different issues and they don't know what your main purpose is. Then it looks like you're just harassing somebody or whatever. So choose what you want and that become, that would become your opening paragraphs. Then you go to facts of the case. Now facts of the case is, a, is literally and simply a story. What are the facts of your story? Do it date-wise, serially, and it started so and so and so and so. Or if there are two, three things that you want to do, like a section on 
uh, the 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 C, the, C, uh, the um, environment uh, problems and a section on the uh, lack of permissions do it section wise but uh, going date wise is normally a good way then you prepare what are the grounds what is your actions what is the reason why you, why it is violating the law and which law and finally what is the relief that you want the relief would be your main relief and your immediate relief interim relief and if it's very 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 urgent then you get an you can ask for an ad interim relief for example if you have found that a that a place has got permission to fell 500 trees and 50 trees are already filled quickly do your demand for justice letter get your petition drafted go to the court and ask for an ad interim relief the ad interim relief would be to yeah it's in the bag there the ad interim relief would be to stop the to stop the uh, further felling of the trees one second Take the phone and put it out somewhere. Okay, sorry. So you go for go for relief to the uh, you you prepare what are the grounds that you want. Third thing, uh, sorry, the release. Then you go to annexures. Annexures are the documents that you are going to annex to your petition. These would be the permissions. These would be the plans. These would be the photographs. Remember to keep a one inch margin or one and a half inch margin and remember to keep give clean copy to the court. If the thing, if the document is a handwritten document, you will need to type it again and give it to the court. You can't type half a document. You either type the full document or you get a good clean document. Then you put the petition together as per the format of the, of the court. Now, the PIL format starts with, sorry, one second, yeah, just, just go to that um, PIL format, the next one. Okay, stop share I put, okay. All right. You then you then prepare the PIL as per the format. The format would be ah yeah yeah no further next next one okay. The format will be the first of all it will have a cause title which is very simple in the in the in the High Court of Bombay and so and so so and so. Then you come to the introductory paragraphs. I don't know where I am. Okay. Anyway, the introductory paragraphs are the description of yourself. Who are you? I am a citizen or I am an NGO or whatever. And then you describe yourself very briefly. And there are certain mandatory paragraphs which you have to uh, put in, which is you have to make a declaration that you have researched this matter properly. You have to also make a declaration that there is no other similar matter filed on this subject before. So that is your research. You have to check and find out that nobody has come with the same issue to the court. You can always try and vary it, but basically it has to be an original sort of a petition. Then you have to say that you have got no personal interest in the matter. Uh, and you have to say that there is no criminal or civil proceeding which you have initiated somewhere else. So you can't have a suit filed somewhere else and also come to the court. These are the declarations. There's also an undertaking which you have to give the court that in case the court asks for a certain amount of money to comply with the, to examine your petition, which the court sometimes asks if they feel that you are not entirely bona fide and so on, they will say, well, deposit this much of money in the court. You have to make the statement that you will pay it. But when the court, if the court does ask, you could say, I can't, sir, I can't pay this much or whatever. But you have to make these statements. Then after you've done that, you put in your ground, Your after you've done these introductory paragraphs, you write your story out. That is, you introduce your facts of the case. After you've done the facts of the case, you put the grounds, which is all your arguments 
why this they are why this work is violating what law now sometimes along with the facts you want to also give your grounds which is okay but try to separate facts from grounds because you have to make a clear statement in the end that these are facts and these are grounds or these are submissions at the end you put your reliefs which is your main relief which is what you want interim that is in the meantime and finally what if you have an ad interim what you want then you do an affidavit where you swear to the truth of what you have given you say what is said in paragraphs 1 3 4 7 12 18 19 20 is true to my own knowledge and what is in the remaining paragraphs is my submissions based on legal information which i believe to be true and correct other documents now what happens in a pil you have filed your petition when the petition comes to the court other side will ask for to file an affidavit in reply next one next they will ask to file an affidavit in reply an affidavit in reply is basically the response of the respondents to your petition they will try to attack your petition and the facts that you have given and the law that you have cited on various grounds so they file an affidavit in reply so suppose on the day your petition is uh, is is uh, filed and it is called out the other side says i am going to here is my affidavit in reply what do you do how do you argue your petition what you should do is if the court is taking it you should tell the court i would like time to consider the reply so you must look at the reply because the reply will give additional facts their replies will give their side of the story it means other facts may come they may also dispute what you said they may give the opposite side so you do should not start in a haste start to argue and then find that the other side is saying something totally different so if you get an affidavit in reply always take time to consider it and the court will always give you time to consider the reply of the other side after you have got your affidavit in reply you will file a rejoinder now a rejoinder is what it is your reply to their replies so when you are doing your reply to their replies you don't have to repeat your whole story all over again your whole story is there in a petition you only have to rejoin or deny anything which is not in accordance with your petition sometimes lawyers have the habit of denying every paragraph they will you if you have looked at petition you will sometimes file they will say with regard to what is said in so and so paragraph i say it is incorrect with regard to so and so paragraph this is done usually in the lower courts but in the high court you don't have to deny every paragraph you put an opening paragraph which says that i deny whatever is said in this affidavit and reply which is not in agreement with my petition with the facts in my petition and specifically i deny the following or you give your version of the following so you then don't make a very long big uh, uh, rejoinder you give a smaller rejoinder but you must take care that if some fact is there which is not as per yours you either deny it or you give some your version of it or whatever if you have said trees were felled and uh, uh, 10 trees were felled and they say that oh, no, not even one tree was felled then you got to say something how you got the figure of 10 trees when they got the figure of no trees so you file your rejoinder and finally there could be a sir rejoinder sir rejoinders are after the rejoinders are over then any more replies they tend to be called sir rejoinder which means one more rejoinder there is also something called an additional affidavit the additional affidavit is if you want to bring any new facts on the record suppose you have done certain amount of uh, your petition has got certain facts and in the meantime you had made application under rti and you got those documents and now you want to put those in the in the in the petition as well you have got two options one option is you can amend the petition and put those documents and those facts in the petition itself 
because when the final hearing comes in your matter the court looks at your petition as a whole so additional documents if they are on the record they look at them but the challenge will be in your petition so sometimes the court will say where have you said this in your petition and you can't say i said it in my affidavit in uh, additional affidavit but the court will say that is not your petition that's an additional affidavit so you must be able to judge whether the fact is so important that it comes into the petition or whether you are saying on that subject in the petition and you are only giving some proof of it for example suppose you have dealt with a matter say on the crz saying it is a violation of the crz notification and later on you come to know that it's all violation of the trees act or it is a violation of forest clearance now if you put that as an additional affidavit then it's not a point in the main petition so what you have to do then is amend the petition put it as a main point in the petition and put the document as well but suppose you have challenged it on crz and you find one more document on the crz aspect then your main issue is already dealt with then an additional affidavit will do so additional affidavits are to bring in new documents and finally there's something called miscellaneous civil application a miscellaneous civil application is used to ask for small small things you might find the other side will file a miscellaneous application to say dismiss this petition because it should not be before the high court it should be before the ngt they'll file an mca you can file a miscellaneous civil application if there is if you ask for certain documents they are not giving it to you you can file an application mcas are a way i have found in my 30 years of practice mcas are a way of keeping the petition alive if you don't file mcas your petition stays on the record once it's admitted and then it could stay till it's called out but mcas keep the matter continuously going so you keep asking for small small things sometimes i have found that while filing when you file many mcas then you get small small things by the time your final matter comes you already got four out of your five points only one point is left to argue so mca is a very good technique to use in a pil now how will you argue a pil first of all there is court decorum and some presentation techniques so let's say you have i am not going to go through it if you decide to go to a lawyer that's a different matter he knows to argue but if you have decided to argue the petition prepare yourself first of all knowing the important facts of your case use those little stickers that you get to mark the important pages what i do is i write down the important facts and i put it on the left hand side of my file on the cardboard side so that all the important things are ready close at hand and you quickly can refer to it why do you do this in writing because i can tell you that in nervousness everything you forget the second thing is court can ask you something and it is not in your way of thinking you had trained your gadi in a particular way court asks you something and you don't know where you are and you don't know what you are doing third thing is you may answer correctly but you forgot where you were so if you have your structure let us assume that nobody is going to disturb you prepare how you will pre presentation keep it on the left hand side of your page look at it from time to time like i am looking at my notes in order to talk to you and you have your page numbers of the important things don't put 200 stickers you will not find even one there should not be more than 15 on that thing because you can't find so many things so when you are doing your documents also arrange them so that you will know where they are so how do you address the court lawyer say your lordship and so on you can simply say sir even if there's a lady judge you can say sir everybody says no everybody doesn't say all the lawyers say lordship you can don't have to remember lordship you can say sir you can say your honor whatever i have said sir from the day i started nobody in the high court used to say sir but i knew that you could say sir and no judge has ever given me a bad judgment because i didn't call him your lordship or my lord or whatever very often in fact law, the court you'll see lawyers use my lord my lord to buy time at least you get 2 seconds while you're saying my lord to think of the next point so my lord is just something which is said 
when you're going to do your case, you may be very angry with government. You may think that they are rascals and they usually have done some hera fairy. Don't start by attacking the, the government and don't start by attacking the other side. Even if you know they are crooks, start by presenting your point of view, your case. What is your issue? What is the activity you are challenging? That's why your opening paragraph is important. You must know what is the issue. So I would come to the court and say, sir, this is a petition which is filed regarding the violation of the Town and Country Planning Act. This is the zone. The party is not in the correct zone. They are putting up a building. This violates this law and so on. I want this to be stopped. This is the very two-line brief note. I'm sure you'll have more than this to say. But tell the court, what is your issue? What is the project? Where has the project reached? If it has reached second floor or it has not started? Like, for example, in the Molay matter, we have gone to court. And the first thing I told the court that nothing has started. I am coming because I don't want anything to start in the wildlife sanctuary. Permissions are there. They could start. So I have come before they have started any work. Maybe they have got to get a few more permissions, but many things are en route, so to say. And therefore, I have come to stop the petition. Um, if the other side interrupts you, the lawyer interrupts you, usually there will be a lawyer. You are a lay person, remember. So don't, don't agitate. Let him talk because courts tend to give in a court room, they tend to give preference to lawyers, but they will not leave you out of sight. So if somebody interrupts, stay quiet. If you have understood what he said, you can say, sir, that is not correct. And I will deal with that and go back to your presentation. Don't go on his road because lawyers have the habit of taking you out of your case. In fact, they will interrupt when you are making a point. I have noticed that when you're making a very good point, somebody will interrupt because they try to deflect the court's attention from what you are saying. So either you reply, but go back. Go back to what you were saying. Otherwise, you will have left your petition halfway and then you will not know where you are. That is why it's important to have your presentation worked out in your head and on the paper. Because I can tell you, it is you do get nervous in the court when a lot of people are there and some senior people and they are flapping their black coats and you get very little bit unnerving because after all, you're a lay person. What dress? Dress simply, sober clothes. Don't dress for carnival. No prohibition. But if you dress for carnival with a flowery bush shirt in pink, red, green, then sometimes the impression is that you're not very serious. So whatever, normal clothes, decent, uh, which you can wear to the court. What happens in the court? The court will hear you briefly and the court will issue notice. What does notice mean? Notice means that prima facie, you'll hear this word, prima facie means at first glance. Prima facie, the court thinks you have a case. Prima facie. It's not yet decided, but they feel that it's okay. Notice means that the court is telling you, give copies of the petition to the other side. As per the court procedure, one copy has already gone to the Advocate General. You will see that in the court procedures when you go to file the petition. But all the respondents have to be given copies. That means the court says, okay, there's something which is here and we want to hear this matter. Then the other side will come for filing replies and so on, and the court will give you a date for admission and interim relief. Now at that stage, at the first stage, suppose there is something very urgent you wanted, then you should tell the court, sir, that in the meantime, the trees will get felled, and so please could you give me add interim relief? And the court may tell the government, and the government may say, all that we won't do anything further. You get that add interim relief. But if there's nothing so very urgent, then you argue your interim relief at the time of the admission. When the other side will take time to file their reply, your rejoinder, counter, whatever, whatever, you file. If your court, if the court admits your petition, issues, it issues what is called rule. R-U-L-E. Rule means that, yes, this is a matter for consideration. We want to hear this matter completely. So that means now your petition is admitted. And the next time it will come will be for final hearing. But remember, in the meantime, I told you, you can file miscellaneous applications for small, small, small things 
that you might want from time to time. So when rule is issued, it goes into the court records and everybody knows now this is a petition which the court is con going to consider. The earliest time that it can come up is within eight weeks, but it never comes up. It can come up after two years. So you can use MCAs in the meantime. If there are any new developments, remember to bring your petition up to date. If one more permission is given, bring it up to date by filing an amendment application, bring it on record. So finally, it will come to final hearing. Now, when it comes to final hearing, the bench which hears it will never be most likely the bench which admitted it. So the judges know nothing and no judges read final hearing matters. They come without any, any reading. Judges look at admission matters before the files go to them in their houses and they look at it. But nobody reads a final hearing matter. It never goes to the judge's house. So you must start from scratch. Even if the judge is the same, don't think he remembers your case. You have to start from scratch. You have to present your case. Now at this time, you can relax a little more because this is the time when you will get all the opportunity to show all your documents. And generally, nobody will interrupt you. So you can make your full case, show all the relevant documents to the court. When you are showing relevant documents to the court, please don't start with the first line, the date and all things. Mark on your copy the relevant paragraph. And then you say to the court, please turn to so-and-so page, page 62. That is, a, uh, that is the permission given by the town and country planning on so-and-so date. The date is on the top right-hand corner. The relevant portion is paragraph four which is towards the second half of the page or right at the bottom of the page or first paragraph, show the main thing. Sometimes the courts want to read the whole document, but at least you be prepared what is the relevant portion that you want to show. Then after you've given your facts of the case, make your submissions. I advise that you prepare your submissions in writing for a final hearing because at the end of the final hearing, you can give your submissions in writing to the court in case they have forgotten to take down, judges write down while you're talking. But in case you have forgotten, they will have your submissions on record. After you've made your presentation, the other side will make their presentation. The party, the government, the town planning, whoever wants to make. And then it will come back to you for your rejoinder. Now in your rejoinder, the other parties will have said lots and lots and lots of things. You don't have to rejoin to everything. Only important points that they made which might affect your case, you can rejoin. They don't give you more than 10 minutes to rejoin. And remember, by that time, the judges more or less made up their minds what they're going to do. So it's, you're not going to be able to change their minds very much unless there is something which was completely wrong that they said and so on. Make your rejoinder. At the end of the matter, tell the court, I have made my, prepared my submissions in writing. May I give a copy? And if there is something you want to add, ask the court, can I give the copy tomorrow of my submissions? They are in writing, but I want to change a few things and give your submission. Then sit and wait for judgment. When you get your judgment, uh, which may be after a few weeks, the, sorry, when you get your judgment, um, the petition could be allowed, which means you have won your case. It could be partly allowed, which means some parts of your case you have won, or it could be dismissed, which means you have lost your case. That I'm using the word lost in the sense of, officially, you don't, your case has not been accepted. But even in a dismissed case, look at the judgment and read it carefully, because there are certain things that the court might have said, which will the government has to comply with, so even though they have dismissed your case, they have told the government to do this, they have told the government to do that, and you should not just take the judgment and throw it in the basket. Read it carefully, see what the court has said, and then follow up with the judgment, the compliance. I find very often in public interest litigations, after the petition is over, they don't, nobody bothers to follow it up. They go to sleep. Then what is the point of you wasting all your time if you will not follow up even a small direction because that direction that you that you pursue can help in some way. I will tell you my our first case was the Ramada case, but technically we had lost the case because we wanted the Ramada building, the hotel brought down because they violated five counts of law. The building was beyond the height 
the building was in the in the 200 meters some portion was there there, there was a um, the drawing of ground water several several things but the the petition was i think it was dismissed but in their judgment the court said that you can't put constructions in the 200 meters and the the uh, the the hotel's lawyer said no no we will remove them so the court recorded it in the order that the council has very really fairly agreed to remove the constructions in the 200 meters and he will do so within two weeks from today or whatever and then he dismissed the petition that is an order which had to be complied with and though we technically lost the case that direction of his remained for all time to come it remained that in the 200 meters the high court will not allow any development so therefore there are things which are said in a judgment which are very very important and therefore you must read it carefully see what is required to be done and try and follow up on that with that whether you win whether you lose remember you made a grand effort you have got a sense of going to the court for the purpose of the public and you have got good practice in filing a public interest litigation. I will stop here and uh, take any questions that you might have. How do you look at questions? Oh, yeah. Okay. How do you check that no other person has filed a similar case? Not very, uh, well, uh, basically there is a certain amount of public knowledge. For example, let us say this Mollet petition. In the paper, certain things come uh, that a case is filed and so you should check that something, whether something similar is filed. If it's a new construction, for example, then nobody has, will have filed something on that particular case. You don't have to know whether anybody has filed a private case for something. You just need to know whether a similar matter challenging the same issue is filed in a court. You can also ask a lawyer, if, if at all, to see whether there is some other case but basically new matters, there is not likely to be a similar case that is filed before. Okay, is there a compulsory format for rejoinders or can one just use common language? No format whatsoever for rejoinders. There is a format for petitions. The format is broad. That means, as I told you, opening paragraphs, um, prelim, par uh, prelim information, early information, um, mandatory paragraphs, which is uh, I have done this, I have not done this, those are mandatory paragraphs. Facts of the case, tell a story. Simple English. Never bother about complicated legal manner. Uh, grounds, you have to put the word grounds and you have to put what your, what violation of law is there. Why you are coming to the court, what is violated. Prayers are there. Those are the main things. Prayers are the reliefs. Afidavit is there. But for rejoinders, you are basically saying that I want to say this to their reply. This is my answer to whatever they say. And remember one thing. Um, you know, sometimes people think that I will spring a surprise. I'll tell the court that. You can't do that. You, there are no surprises in the court. You can't uh, say that, well, this is the thing and here's my document. The court will immediately tell you, file an affidavit. Put it on record because courts are places where people have to know and a reason judgment has to be given. You can't do, there are no surprises there. Therefore, don't hide anything and take it out last minute. You can't put new documents in a rejoinder, remember. If you're putting a new document, you have to file an additional affidavit. Okay, wait, one minute. If you have made a factual mistake on the fine, uh, why? No, no. No, we are gone too down. One minute, one minute. Uh, no, no, no. If you have made a factual mistake in your petition and then subsequently file an amendment, do you physically need to correct the error on the main petition lying with the court as well? Yes. Suppose there is a small factual date 
some date is wrong or some number is wrong, you can tell the court that there is an error at paragraph so and so, and I want to change that particular thing. And the court will give permission straight away and say that the petitioner is allowed to correct the petition at this point. But if you have made, a, if there's a complicated uh, error that you have made, and you want to remove that paragraph and put another paragraph, or you want to add another line, a whole line, then the court may say, file a draft amendment, which means that you bring your thing on writing and you give it to the court and the court will allow that amendment in terms of whatever you have filed. That you give that paragraph so-and-so contains this, I want it to state as follows. Once your petition is admitted, that means rule is issued, then if you try to amend the petition, the other side can object. They can say that, no, no, uh, this petition was only about this subject. Now they are broadening the scope of the petition and widening the scope. That they may object to. But before your petition is admitted, you can amend as many times as you want. I mean, not as many, but you can make an amendment and the government and the other side does not, uh, does not object to uh, an amendment. But yes, you have to correct the error on the petition lying with the court. Very often the court will say, give an amended copy of the petition to the other side. Then you got to make a copy again of the, of the whole petition and give it to the other side. So it's not a, you know, you should prepare the petition properly. Why give submission? Uh, uh, Norma, could I just ask for a yes, bit of clarification please. on that? Yes. Um, so you've given in the amendment request, yes. uh, which is a separate document. Uh, then do you need to go to the office of the court and say, right, I've submitted this amendment in the court. Uh, now you need to actually make the physical changes by putting a, a, a line through the errors in the original petition and write on top of it the, the new stuff? Or just does the amendment document sit alongside the original petition, but the, uh, the incorrect original petition lies as it is, and then the amendment supplements it, and so that's the end of the matter? Or do you physically need to put like a, a line through the error? in the original petition you have in the office of the court you have to go to the office of the court and all of that yeah stuff. you have to go to the office of the court and you have to correct both the copies you have to first show the court the, the office where the court allowed you to amend it so there'll be an order that the order will say allow him to amend it within two weeks you show the uh, the office that yeah i'm allowed to amend then show the amendment petition of yours whatever you have to amend they will allow you to physically do it. You have to physically correct it. The amendment petition, whatever you want to go is in a separate file. It never comes to the court afterwards. They will physically allow you. They will check what you have uh, done along with what uh, was allowed to be done. And then you sign and then the court will say, uh, the, the office superintendent will sign before me, this amendment was carried out, which means that I verify it is correct. No, you have to physically do it. And court. that's just done by pen, is it? Just by... Uh, no, actually, if it's a uh, if it's a number of lines, then you do it on a on a, with a, on green paper with red ink, red red carbon. What you use, no, it means you go to a you you go to let us say you go to a print shop and uh, give your pen drive and uh, they'll print it on red on green paper. Green paper is court paper, correct? Right. Right. And uh, you have to print an amendment in red. Just those words that have to be changed are in red. Yes. The rest is in black. Yes. 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 It's all yes. quite complicated, right? No, it's okay. not very complicated. Suppose, suppose you wanted to change a date, then you can cancel and put the date in red. In writing, just by. In writing. Writing. Suppose you wanted to add two words, you can, yes. you can, you can write in red the two words that you wanted to add. Okay. But if you want to put a paragraph, then the court doesn't allow you to put a whole paragraph by writing it. So then you take a piece of paper and you it's in you don't write it in red, but usually now we go to because your your petition copy is typed, no? It's not a handwritten petition. So yeah. you simply just go to a print shop and say, please print this paragraph for me in red, which they have the color printing, what they will call. Mm -hmm. So you take they'll print it a green, then you cut that pay that small bit, and then they'll ask you to stick it in the place where you want to stick it. Okay. That's how it's done. But if you, you want to delete to... a paragraph, you can just write, do it with that. Yes, hands. you can cut it out. Yes, right. you can cut it out. Okay. okay. But you have to physically do it on the court copy. For the other side, you don't, we don't give a color copy. 
for the other side we we printed in black only if you have to give it and we put two red lines on the side to show that this was amended this was the amended part so that the the lawyer knows that it's an amended part just that's that's what is done okay then if uh, okay why give submissions again on the final day of argument and they already part of your original petition um the fine the, the submissions is given uh, see uh, when you are arguing your petition finally the court will uh, take down what you are saying the court takes down what you are presenting the court will keep on asking questions it will say where have you said this then you must know where you have said it you can't just you know make up your own stories there is standing so they last you you must know the paragraph um then you can show the court where you have said this where you have said that and you can repeat your submissions courts usually have a pad and they write down what you orally presented and generally they put in the judgment whatever they the way they have understood what you have said so you are explaining in whatever way in this way and the court is taking down notes the judgment may not be delivered straight away they may write it inside now if you want to make sure that all your points that you have argued are in your final judgment which is what lawyers uh, do then you simply say my submissions wherein you don't have to do it in the way you have done it in the court but in the way you have talked more like that that you know um, my submission my first submission is that this is the thing my second submission is this my third submission you are summarizing your presentation more or less i am only saying it's uh, you we do it because then the, that paper goes with that's not to be sworn in it's not an affidavit then it goes with the judge and when he's going to dictate your judgment which he will do in his room he looks at your paper and he says as per the petitioner and then he will use your your ideas and nothing will get left out only for that reason it is not that uh, if you don't do it he is not going to say it he may not say it he may will say it but to be sure that what you have said comes in it there we do that and there is a question there which is uh, if the court has made a mistake in the final order should you point it out then and there to the judge now if the judgment is being dictated in the court uh, the judge is thinking like i am thinking while i am talking and judges don't like to be disturbed and interrupted and they may shout at you so make a note of something which is an error you can little bit put your hand you know sort of make a little sign that something is the judge may ask you but don't interrupt the judge because his thought process will be disrupted and he will get very annoyed and he will shout at you so when he finishes you can tell him that sir what you said when you talked about pollution control board it was not pollution control board but it was actually goa coastal zone management authority you can do that if the if the if he stops and pauses and somebody else interrupts him you can use that opportunity to also say that i there is one error which you have made earlier but do not interrupt when it's a running running dictation even if it is wrong don't interrupt advocate general sometimes interrupts and they don't shout at them but a lay person no do not interrupt the judge if there is a complete error which has been made then you file for a review a review petition is filed when there is an error on the face of the record which means that if the judge has said the first permission was given in the year 2004 and actually the permission was given in the year 2014 that's an error on the face of the record then you got to go back to the court and point out that this is an error on the face of the record and the court may kindly correct the record so that is where you can correct the 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 record okay then if there is already a similar case can you add your case with different documents such as new photographs and new evidence supporting your original petition now if there is a case which is going on let us say somebody is filing a case against the taj hotel and uh, there are two things one is you could think that that is a petition which is filed with very poor facts and it will become a res judicata matter it will become what is called a case already finished then you can't file 
you can do you can you can't add your case to that you can file a, a petition but this must be a petition not disposed of huh? it is a petition which is ongoing which is there in the court so when you are making that statement that no other case has been filed before you are talking of no judgment has been given before in this matter you are not talking of a running petition an ongoing petition it doesn't mean that so suppose somebody has filed a petition on molen you want to file your own petition petition on molen you file your own petition court will say openly that uh, isn't there another petition on this subject then you can say yes sir, if you know you can say uh, that yes a petition was filed by goa foundation then court will say then tag your petition along with goa foundation but you cannot tell the court i have got certain documents i want to add them to their petition court will say if you got certain documents why don't you talk to mrs alvarez and give her the petition the documents i'm sure she will add them if she finds them relevant so file your own petition do not file an intervener application to join on the side of the petitioner i don't know if you un understand me there is a petitioner there is goa foundation you support it you want to also join goa foundation no you cannot join the petitioners you can add to yourself to the petitioners you can add yourself to a respondent that means i am an affected party goa foundation has not joined me i am a very much seriously concerned with this matter please join me the court will join you as an intervener which means you will be appearing substantially opposed to goa foundation you may agree with some things but you may have your point of view you can't say add me to help goa foundation the court will say do that outside the court talk to goa foundation and add yourself there suppose you want to file your own petition and you are not sure that goa foundation has got the issue right file your own petition goa foundation is not yet disposed of it is still only admitted no judgment has come out that doesn't mean that there is no other issue on this matter it means that there is no judgment on this matter then the court will say okay you have got a petition we'll hear it along with the goa foundation's petition okay i hope i have uh, understood um, explained it to you maria teres abra what abra okay all right uh, so you put your new photograph you put your new evidence but don't say i'm supporting so and so that you don't say you just say this is my petition then the court hears both the petition tell your goa foundation first they'll you say your you second there are so many times where somebody has filed a petition and i have filed another petition and then the court will take it up they'll you hear them two together they take up which is the broader one first and so on what is the letter petition where and how is it to be filed and which court and what should be the contents of a letter letter petition was an in, was an invention which was done by the supreme court basically let us say you you don't want to file a petition but you you have an issue you write a letter to the court but a letter petition doesn't get a number it does not necessarily become a public interest petition it is simply a letter to the court which you write and say to the court that there is this issue and i feel it's of importance and so on the court may convert your letter into a pil and then the court will appoint an amicus curiae and amicus curiae will handle your petition the court if you have given your address may issue a notice to you and say okay please come to the court we are converting this into a letter petition you know there was a whole petition on this uh, fishing ban it was a letter petition somebody wrote to the court and said that there was a monsoon ban on fishing which was for 3 months and now the court has reduced it and the government has reduced it to 24 uh, one month and 24 days from 1st of june to 24th of july for earlier it was till 30th september it was a two pair two three paragraph letter the court took it up as a letter petition and then they appointed me because they tried to find the original person and he was no longer to be found and he didn't come to the court or whatever i don't know the court appointed me as the as the amicus curiae to help the court so letter petition is even recently somebody wrote a letter to the court courts convert them but you can't insist whereas if you file a public interest litigation and pay or the stand of the money 150 rupees which you have to pay it has to come up before the court you can't say that oh i wrote you a letter and what did you do with it no that's not possible 
somebody in fact wrote a letter to the court i believe saying that we wanted to join this public interest course and this goa foundation has stopped it at uh, 100 people and so on and we are left out so <laughs> nothing has happened about that letter whatever is written i don't know whether it's a letter petition or what are there any other tricks that lawyers use which would be helpful to know so that they can be counted interruption is one of them i told you if you are making your good point you'll find an interruption uh, they don't do it at final hearing so much but at admission oh yes you can be badgered with a lot of interruptions and then you get all mixed up and so on so as i said uh, you know stay quiet breathe a little bit and know where you have to go and go back to your petition if you can't hear because sometimes you can't understand what they are saying you stick to your petition oh one of the things i forgot to tell you is if the court asks a question you must answer it you even if you wanted to answer it at the end of your story you must answer it immediately if the court says uh, what is the stage of the construction don't start with the permission was given in june 2015 and after that a second permission and then then you going to come to the answer then the court gets instead of asking they feel for hiding something so if the court asks something try to answer it as best can if the court says why have you come now when the construction has reached the second floor what were you doing all the all this while then you have to have an answer so think of the answer so you can say so we did not come in the beginning because if it is only two floors then it is okay as per the settlement zone but now we have come to know that actually they are going to build a seven story building and that's our problem and they've not yet started the the third floor and so we feel that we have as soon as we came to know uh, then the other side will say it was put on the board then you can say that we did not exactly see it yes it's true i'm a neighbor i'm living close by but we did not think and something you can say but think of an answer to give to the court whatever don't don't uh, try to sidetrack the answers another trick that lawyers do is they don't answer the court's questions court will ask something they will say something and then it goes this way that way and sometimes the judges forget that they have asked also the question so those are some tricks but there are many tricks all right should letter petitions be addressed to separate special judge you know you just put it to the administrative judge or to the senior judge uh, there's no special uh, special per person that you have to add if the original pil is weak can that influence the judgment of a second pil filed separately on a similar subject it is quite likely that is the problem with original petition sometimes they are filed by what you would call in common layman language bakwas somebody files a petition just to get some answer from the court dismissing the petition then you can't file on the same thing and say that petition was weak the chance is so to speak lost it it it's very tricky because if you are going to file another petition on another aspect which was not covered in that petition then it may be okay suppose that petition talked about it is uh, uh, this this uh, it's about the public uh, road there's no there's no setback kept from the road and so on so and so and then the setback is kept and the petition is closed now can you go back to the court on that same construction pointing out that it is violating town planning law you can because what that petition took up was one aspect only and it was not dealing with the point that you are raising you can so therefore suppose a petition like that is ongoing it is before the court and it's not yet got a judgment then it's a good time for you to file your petition and as if you file an intervener as i told you you cannot help the petition you can only be on the other side interveners also have no no right to file an affidavit they can only make submissions because they are making submissions on the basis of what is there they cannot introduce new facts so it is always better to file your own petition saying whatever has to be said but if the matter is disposed of and it did not cover your point then yes you can come with a petition 
But if it covered your point and was argued badly, then really you can't do very much on the subject. Yes. Yes, there will be different benches for the two PILs, but the government is sure to tell the court that there was a similar petition which was filed last year on the same subject and the court has dismissed that petition, then the judge will say, please give me a copy of that, uh, that, uh, that order, not petition, give me a copy of that judgment. They will produce it and the court will say, sorry, you were sleeping. The thing was happened last year, you've come too late. Okay, so new judge doesn't mean a uh, new petition. Okay. All right, I see some, thank you very much. There are a few more questions at the top of the chat. Okay, let me go back. Uh, yeah, but what is the question? Why am I not getting it? Good evening, everyone I've got. Oh, this is Claude something. 6.14. I've got 6.13. Why don't you read the question then? To file a PIL. Do you need to establish that the affected parties would have difficulty filing the PIL themselves? Uh, no, you don't need to do that. You are filing a petition, PIL, because it is presumed that the affected parties not only have difficulty, the affected parties don't want to come to the court, let's say. And they don't want to come to the court about this matter, but you feel that this is a matter of a violation of an environment law, which should not happen. So you are filing in public interest. I used, I mentioned that thing about affected people only because suppose this activity is taking place on the top of the, in, in some hill, which is in a very remote area, and you are not able to go there. Then you can get the statement of a person there and you can file the petition. But basically, the court doesn't ask you why the others are not coming. That the court never asks. It is presumed that you are of interest. You have got an interest in the matter. And uh, mostly the government will, another trick they will try to show is that uh, you have compromised in some manner. You, have, you are related to somebody. You have uh, also got a similar building somewhere else. And you are trying to complain about uh, somebody's violation. But you yourself have violated. Things like that is uh, the tricks that I use. But the court doesn't ask. It is assumed that you are coming because uh, uh, on behalf of other people. And it could be two people. It could be one person. It could be five people. It could be an organization. No issue. Okay. Vera, what's the next question? Yes. As an RTI yes, I can see that. As an RTI application is filed by an individual for information, Will a PIL petition be less effective in the eyes of a court if it is filed by an affected individual? Well, I don't know, the, I don't know what you mean uh, by the question. Whether a PIL is less affected if filed by an individual or an organization, I don't know, that's your question. Uh, no, it is not less effective, whether it's filed uh, by an individual or an organization. It has um, just as much strength and validity a, if it is uh, filed by the uh, an individual. But I, I, I don't know if I've answered your question because you say the RTI application is filed by an individual for information. Okay, uh, suppose suppose an RTI is filed by an, in, by, by let us say, um, let us say John. And uh, John and uh, let us say Savio are both friends. And Savio wants to file the petition. Then the RTI documents which are obtained by John can be included by Savio in his petition saying that this is obtained under RTI. He doesn't have to say this is obtained under RTI by John. He doesn't have to give the name of the person. As long as it is under RTI, he can definitely say I, I have got these documents obtained under RTI because the RTI document will show the stamp. No, it will have a stamp which says issued under RTI. But if the other side says that it is uh, this, uh, these documents were given to John, and not Savio, that's all right. It doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. You can file a petition even if the RTI is to somebody else. Yes. If you file a PI, do the demand for justice letters have to be written from you as well, or could you demand? Uh, no, no. Preferably the demand for justice by you. 
don't use the demand for justice letter sent by a friend because then the court will say, why is that fellow not coming to the court? So demand for justice must be uh, done by you, but you can include the demand for justice sent by a friend to show that other people have also written. In the Mole petition, which is our most recent petition, we sent our demand for justice uh, letter, but we included with it the, the letters written by uh, uh, citizens groups, by um, other groups, by lawyers. We put uh, several copies of letters written by other people also, but we put ours. Ours has to be there. Court will not ask you if anybody else complained. Court will ask whether you complained. You have to have the demand for ju justice letter. Okay. So, I don't think there's anything else left out and it's right down. All right. What's the time limit to file a review petition in the court? Uh, if it's um, normally 30 days, normally 30 days, but if you are finding an error on the face of the record, then I suggest that you file it as soon as possible because you don't have to write a long story. You simply have to um, file a short petition which says that these are the following errors which have been made and therefore they should be corrected. But you cannot file a, a, a review petition to correct a wrong judgment. If the, if the court on the basis of the wrong facts has made, has come to a wrong conclusion, you can get the fact corrected but you will have to go in appeal against that judgment to the Supreme Court or to the higher court. It's for the court to figure out if, he want to, if they want to change their judgment, but they actually they cannot change their judgment also. That means the whole judgment has become a mess. But you can only correct in review, you can correct the incorrect facts and within 30 days. So that's quite a precise lecture. Okay. Exactly at 7.30, uh, Mrs. Alvarez has stopped her, uh, um, her lecture and all the questions also are over. So thank you once again for another session. Where is the Mrs. Alvarez's gift? Please, please give it. Uh, and I yes. will. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I will give my notes um to uh, the oh, the uh, to roshan and the office and uh, they are all they are sort of already here but i made a few marks on it so uh, they will send it to you by um, email so you'll have full ready without uh, paying fees you've got uh, oh no you paid some fees here but no legal fees to get a lecture thank you so much i have also sent you the, uh, your homework for the 10th of uh, of uh, August, uh, the things that you got to do in relation to the demand for justice letters uh, and the work that you got to do in identifying all the officers in the various departments, the IDs and telephone numbers, and that has to be communicated with Om Dikosta. All that is given to you in the email message. So thank you very much and good night. Is it a one, one little smart thing is that I kept my watch in, in front.